Carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy gives some useful information about the carbon skeleton of a molecule. And hydrogen-1 NMR spectroscopy, usually called proton NMR, gives us even more information. Because hydrogen-1 accounts for about 99.98% of all hydrogen, proton NMR is much more sensitive than C13 NMR. So while it takes either hundreds of milligrams of sample or several hours to acquire a good C13 spectrum, a high quality proton spectrum can usually be obtained with five to 10 milligrams of a sample in a few minutes. Additional information can be gleaned from a proton spectrum that can't be determined by C13 NMR. But the basics are the same. A proton spectrum has a normalized absorption frequency on the x-axis, delta for chemical shift in units of ppm, and runs from low frequency at the right to high frequency at the left. Like in C13 NMR, the zero point of the spectrum is arbitrarily defined by the absorption of tetramethylsilane, TMS. But while C13 spectra usually span about a 220 parts per million range, H1 spectra typically go from 0 to 10 ppm, with rare peaks as high as 15. Hydrogens attached to sp3 carbons are typically between 0 and 5 ppm, with higher chemical shifts being seen for hydrogens closer to more electronegative atoms. Hydrogens on simple alkyl groups are usually between 0.5 and 2 ppm, and hydrogens on sp3 carbons that are directly bonded to oxygen are usually between 3 and 4.5 ppm. Above about 5 ppm, we find hydrogens bonded to sp2 carbons. Alkenes usually between about 5 and 6, benzene rings in the 7 to 8 range, and aldehyde hydrogens are usually around 10 ppm. There are many more details about the positions of hydrogens in common functional groups in your textbook. Hydrogen atoms bonded to heteroatoms, O, N, or S usually, can be found anywhere in the spectrum and are extremely difficult to predict. Carboxylic acids are the most reliable and can usually show up very downfield, around 14 or 15 parts per million. All of these types of hydrogen atoms can participate in hydrogen bonding, which, ten which tends to broaden the peaks just as it did in IR spectra. They are sometimes identified by adding heavy water, D2O, to a sample. This tends to replace these protic peaks with deuterium, make, thereby making the peaks disappear. This is called exchange with D2O and is often seen labeled on spectra to identify this sort of hydrogen. Do you recall that I said that peak heights in carbon-13 NMR were not reliable for determining the number of carbons with a particular chemical shift? That's true, they're not. But lucky for us, the sizes of peaks in proton spectra are reflective of the relative number of hydrogens absorbing that frequency. But it's not precisely the height of the peak that reflects the number of hydrogens, it's the area under the peak, or to use the calculus term, the integration. Integrations are sometimes represented by S curves, illustrated over peaks. The distance from flat part to flat part of an S-curve represents the integration. We can compare the integrations of two peaks to determine the ratio of hydrogens between the two peaks. It's important to point out that integrations are relative. They show ratios between peaks, not actual numbers of hydrogens. Methyl t-butyl ether, for instance, has this spectrum. The t-butyl protons are more upfield because they're farther from oxygen than the methyl groups. 
If you measured the S-curves that illustrated the integrations of those peaks, you might find that they were 1.5 inches and 4.5 inches. So you'd know that the ratio of hydrogens represented by each peak is 1 to 3. Of course, in the molecule, we can see that there are three hydrogens here and nine here. So it's the ratio of one to three that we can tell from the integrations on the spectrum. In order to obtain quality NMR spectra, the compound we're obtaining a spectrum of needs to be in solution, dissolved. Since most solvents contain hydrogen atoms, and we're typically only using a few tens of milligrams of a compound to acquire its NMR spectrum, there's a lot more solvent present than the compound of interest. The solvent's own hydrogen atoms would be way more abundant than the compound we're looking at, and would completely overwhelm the interesting peaks. To get around this, we typically use deuterated solvents for proton NMR in which all of the hydrogen atoms of the solvent have been replaced by deuterium, 2H, the heavier isotope of hydrogen, which does not absorb radio frequencies in the same range as protons, so it doesn't interfere. Some of the most common solvents for this are chloroform D, CdCl3, benzene D6, and dimethyl sulfoxide D6. In the process of creating these isotopically enriched solvents, a small amount of the H1 containing solvent is usually still present. These are often seen in spectra and simply ignored. Similarly, trace amounts of water are often seen in NMR spectra because the glassware we use to make the solution is slightly wet, or the NMR solvent hasn't been dried thoroughly, or any number of other reasons. Proton NMR, as we've seen, gives us a sense of the number of hydrogens in a molecule, as well as the chemical environments of those hydrogens. There's still more that this technique can tell us about a compound's structure, but that is for a future week.